All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Well, Lord, I pray you will guide my words today, that there'll be words that encourage, that help, that give us your perspective. We give you glory. May you receive honor in it all, in it all Lord Jesus. Amen. So I think I've got some ringing going on here yet. So I'm sure the guys with the sound booth will take care of that quickly. Um,
Jeff and Leslie are gone on vacation, as are Greg and Catherine, so you have to put up with me today. And uh, uh, for the next few weeks. So, you know, hopefully somebody will come back in the next week or two. We'll see what happens. As I was praying about, you know, what to share here, I felt like the overall theme that the Lord gave me was prepare for the coming storm. And to be honest, it's like, can I talk about something else, Lord? I, I, this really isn't what I would prefer to talk about, but I do feel like it's the basic theme that he gave me. You know, we're, we're in a, a day and an age when we're facing increasing hostility in our culture, aren't we? You know, as a, re, a practical reality, our, our culture increasingly has embraced a postmodern, uh, atheistic, socialistic, uh, any, anything, just about anything contrary to scripture. The majority of Americans today now embrace same-sex marriage is okay. A survey taken a little over a year ago uh, indicated that among mainline Protestants, approximately two out of three think same-sex marriage is okay. And even among white evangelicals, approximately a third of them say same-sex marriage is okay. Actually, I didn't include what that survey said for, uh, for our black brothers and sisters who are evangelical. They're actually in a little better spot than some of us white guys are. You know, they, they actually a lower percentage of them accepted same-sex marriage, but the point being, we're in a culture that's embracing increasingly moral standards that run totally contrary to scripture. We've got major Protestant denominations that have embraced same-sex marriage or that are facing major rifts in it. We've got a rise of more skeptics and, and uh, people who are turning to atheism and denying the faith. You know, in the political realm, in the legal realm, in the education realm, we've got in growing hist hostility, right? Just recently I read a, a survey indicating that a, a, it, it was about three out of four conservative students going to schools and universities feels they've just kind of got to be quiet about their views, because otherwise they're facing serious repercussions from professors or others in the university. There's a lot uh, uh, that's been going on in trying to shut down a Christian viewpoint. And we have a, a problem with diluting the gospel, also called syncretism. You mix a little bit of what the Bible says with other values, other religions, other things going on. Do you run into that in our culture today, where people quote the Bible, but in the process twist it around to promote something that's totally antithetical to clear teaching of Scripture, whether on moral standards or marriage or any number of other topics. So that's what we're facing. So for this series, I'm going to be focusing on Peter's second letter. And I know I'm not going to do justice to it, it's even over a span of a few weeks. I'm not going to be able to do a detailed verse by verse, but I, I hope to cover a few of the fundamental themes that the Apostle Peter had to say to us written by the Apostle Peter. Now, the only reason I note that, there are, in more recent decades, certain scholars who wanted to question that. I won't go into the details, but I accept the fact that Peter said he wrote this letter, I accept it, and I think there's ample evidence historically for that. It was written shortly before he was martyred. Uh, Apostle Peter was martyred, uh, you know, he, he expressly said, I know my time here is short. I'm, you know, I'm going to be dying soon. So, according to tradition, he was uh, crucified upside down under Pontius Pilate, or pardon me, under Nero. And, uh, you know, he suffered a, a horrible death in standing for the testimony of the Lord. Okay, well, here's a man who's, who's going to write a letter. And he knows he's about to die. You stop and think about it. If somebody's on his deathbed or he, or he knows death is approaching, but he wants to talk to a, a loved one. He wants to say, hey, the final things that you want to leave to them. You know, forgetting anything else, here's the final thing I want you to remember. That's, in essence, what this letter is about. I think I just turned it off. Okay, there we go. So this happened during Nero's reign. This has been covered some in the past, but I, I think it's 
I like to go through history. In case a few of you know, I kind of like to cover a little bit of history. For me, historical context does a couple of things. For one thing, it gives us a better, a little bit more insight to what was going on for the, the Christians who were facing the, the, the issues that Peter was writing about 2,000 years ago. What was going on for them? It helps give us a little better appreciation, but also then in the process, it can help me, and I hope help you, draw upon, well, okay, is anything similar to to that going on with us today. So under Nero's reign, he was a very evil man. Generally, he left Christians alone. They didn't have a lot of problems under him until after July of AD 64. There was a major fire that devastated a huge part of Rome. Some accounts indicate well over half of Rome. There may be some different accounts, but they didn't have fire codes, and a huge portion of the city was devastated by a fire in 64 AD. In the wake of that fire, there was a rumor that arose that Nero started this fire because he had this huge building project he wanted to have. And even though he was a brutal emperor, every brutal emperor still has to do something to pacify the masses, or sooner or later he's not going to be emperor. So he had to come up with a scapegoat. And in this instance, it wasn't Jews. Christians, specifically Christians, became his scapegoat. The persecution primarily centered uh, in Rome at that point. Later on, there would be empire-wide persecution. And I, I found some interesting things, reading a little bit from Tacitus' summary of what was going on. Tacitus was a Roman historian during that era. One thing that's interesting he writes about Jesus Christ. He makes a reference to Jesus Christ, this man Christus who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, but still the myth goes on. Extra biblical authors, including men such as Tacitus, pointed to the fact there was a man named Jesus Christ who was crucified under Pontius Pilate and that his followers attested that he was still alive. Nobody, even an atheist, can credibly state there was no Jesus Christ because we have evidence not just from the Bible, but from other historical records about his life and death. Well, Tacitus wrote during this time that Christians were hated for their abominations. Well, what were their abominations? Simply put, they were, you know, they basically withdrew from pagan culture. They wouldn't participate in the idolatry and the lifestyles of that culture. That was an abominable practice. And when some of those Christians were placed under persecution, what happened is some of them sold out their fellow believers. They recanted their faith. They renounced. And, well, yeah, Brother Joe or Sister Sue, you know, whatever their names, yeah, they're, they're believers. So there was a scenario where believers turned on believers. Have you ever had a scenario when placed under pressure, you, you had a a friend, a brother, or sister in Christ who turned, who backtracked, who, who, you know, maybe you feel betrayed to faith. Has that happened in your life? What happened back then? And we have, uh, you know, it, it's interesting where Tacitus wrote that the Christians were convicted, not so much for arson. They really weren't found guilty of starting the fire in Rome. What they were convicted for was their hatred of mankind. Is there anything semi-similar to that happening today? If we stand up and espouse a biblical view on things, what's the label? Well, you're a racist, right? Or you're a homophobe, right? Or you're an Islamophobe, or you're a fill-in-the-blank, right? Now, we aren't facing quite the issues that some of them were because some were crucified. Others were dipped in tar and made into human torches while Nero turned it into a circus atmosphere. And still others were wrapped in animal skins and wild dogs tore them apart literally while others stood on and mocked. Now, you and I are not facing that. But the devastation of the human depraved heart is capable of doing some very horrible things. 
You and I aren't facing this yet, but are there fellow believers in the world who have been beheaded, just in our, even in our own times, who've lost everything they have, their homes, what little you know, they had in this world? So there's a, the heavy push of persecution that they were facing, but there's also kind of a two-pronged thing. There was a rise of false prophets and teachers, those who rejected uh, biblical truth, and believers were facing a rise of false teachers and prophets who were proclaiming a false gospel and who opposed and mocked the teachings of Peter and of other apostles. And they promoted doctrines that were contrary to Scripture. And they openly adopted and promoted immoral, immorality and fleshly indulgence and practices that the Bible calls sin. I think it was interesting that Pastor Greg last week talked about false prophets. And I'm not going to focus extensively on that today, but in my series I plan to talk about false prophets a couple weeks from now. And it's interesting, Pastor Jeff's been working through the Sermon on the Mount, which includes a talking about false prophets. Independently of that, Pastor Greg had a message last week about false prophets. And I'm going to be talking about it too. And I had no clue what Pastor Greg was going to do last week or anything like that. I take away from that, maybe the Holy Spirit wants us to learn something about false prophets. And I hope that what I'll offer uh, will be of some value to complement and, uh, and add to what already has been said or will be said. So I need to move on here. Again, this is um, essentially Peter's last will and testimony. That testament. You know, he realized he's going to die soon. So it's, it's a man who's kind of leaving. What's the last words that I want to leave to some people that I love? And so he wanted them to hold on to he, something to sustain them in the face of testing. And like I say, it's kind of a two prong testing. One is the hatred, the persecution, the suffering. But then combined with that, also the lure of false teaching. To, hey, hey, come back to this lifestyle and you'll be just fine. A kind of a two-pronged attack there that they were facing. So with that, let's take a look at the opening uh, comments by the Apostle Peter here in his letter. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours, by the righteousness of God our Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them... <clears throat> you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. I'll key in on a, a few of the, the points that he has to say here. One thing that he says to a fellow believers who are facing persecution or about to face some very intense persecution and suffering May God's grace and peace be multiplied to you. There's a point there, even when things seem to be falling apart, there is a point of refuge and peace in the midst of a storm. If we have a refuge in Jesus Christ. That it's, and he it doesn't say just, may you just barely get enough grace and peace. He says, may it be multiplied. God's grace doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be easy. Doesn't mean there's not going to be sacrifice, but there is a grace and a peace that can be poured out into our lives even as we walk through difficult times. His letter was written to fellow believers. He says to, you know, it, he wrote to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing. So in that regard, Peter was writing as a man saying, I'm saved by the grace of God. I'm no better than you. God loved you just as every bit as much as he loved the Apostle Peter and everyone else. 
At the same time, he wrote with apostolic authority. He wasn't better than anybody else, but he was among those who had witnessed Jesus' life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection. And a key point on that, I'll touch on this a little bit next week, God willing. What do we do with the apostles? What do, can we trust the Bible? Because in trusting the Bible, we have to trust what the apostles wrote. Much of the New Testament was written by the apostles. So what do we do with them and their lives and their testimony? Men who, as far as we can tell, they all were martyred for their faith in Jesus Christ. Peter goes on to say that, his, that God's divine power has granted all things that we need. God's divine power has granted everything we need for life and godliness through the knowledge of God. So our growth in Christ, the opportunity to press on, to persevere, takes more than just human effort. It's more than just a positive mental attitude. It's, you know, I'm just going to resolve to do better next time. We need God's divine power. We need God's grace. We need God's strength. We just try to do it in our strength, our own wisdom. We're going to have trouble. But he also talks that we can have this through the true knowledge of our Lord, Jesus Christ. So what's, what kind of knowledge is he talking about? The knowledge that Peter's talking about here is more than just a knowledge about God. It's more than an intellectual thing. Back when I was in college, there was a couple summers I was a counselor at a Bible camp. And a couple of guys periodically would do a, one of those campfire things, kind of a, a little interplay. Hey, do you know George Washington? Well, yeah, I know all about George Washington, but did you know George Washington personally? Well, no, of course not, you know. And, do the similar kind of thing with Thomas Edison, but then come to Jesus Christ. Okay, you know all about Jesus Christ, but do you know Jesus Christ? Do we, he's talking about more than having an intellectual knowledge about the Lord, he's talking about knowing the Lord. It's one thing for me to say, you know, I know about so and so. It's another thing for me to say, yeah, I know. I know him. I have a relationship with him. That's what he's talking about. God calls us to reflect his glory and his excellence. And that comes through a true knowledge of God. True knowledge of God produces holiness. If, if we really know the Lord, it's supposed to show up in our lives, in our hearts, our attitudes. Now, I need to quickly add... Every one of us is a work in progress. I've been walking with the Lord for well over 40 years now. I'm still a work in progress. I'm glad it's a throne of grace we come to. <laughs> I don't know how many times in my life I've said, I'm glad it's a throne of grace that we come to. Nobody's perfect. None of us has arrived. We, none of us will arrive this side of eternity. But still, that's, that's part of the aim. The knowledge that Peter was talking about, he has that basic relationship with Jesus Christ. It's a personal relationship based on biblical truth. And as I said, we live in a culture where increasingly people are twisting the scriptures and turning away and, and finding ways to pervert the message of the gospel and, and the message of the truth of God's word. The knowledge he's talking about is something that's based upon a clear teaching of scripture. In contrast, there was the rise of false teachers and prophets who were, who were talking about a different kind of knowledge. And there would be the rise of Gnosticism, which really hadn't borne full fruit at this point, but the seeds of it were there. The people who come along saying a super spiritual knowledge that's devoid of any practical holiness and godliness that, that separated the practical realities of following the Lord in this time, in this life, and how I talk, how I live, how I speak, how I conduct myself, including my moral standards from supposedly a knowledge of God, you know, kind of this mystical high-end knowledge that was devoid of godly character. False teachers taught a form of knowledge that resulted in license for immorality. 
But moving on. We're partakers of the divine nature. God granted us his precious and very great promises so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption of the world because of sinful desire. So he talks about the promises of God. I can remember as a young Christian, they see these books, you know, the pocket book of Bible promises, you know, and, and, uh, different, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with those, of promises of encouragement and hope and strength and protection from God. A lot of times those books didn't have the promises about, you know, all those who are going to be living a godly life are going to suffer persecution or... <laughs> I guess it's a promise, you know, we can hold on to it. <laughs> Not the kind of promise I usually like to think about, but what's the purpose of the promises of Scripture? What's the ultimate overriding purpose? So the ultimate goal is for us to be partakers of, this, of the divine nature, the way Peter puts it. Now, by the divine nature, he's not talking about we become God. We remain created men and women, redeemed by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. But what he's talking about is we reflect the character of God. We become made righteous by Jesus Christ, by his suffering and death. But the purpose then is that we grow to reflect godly character, to be godlike in terms of our conduct. The overriding goal of the Bible is for us to reflect the glory of God, to glorify God, to give him glory in how we live, how we conduct ourselves. It's not just so, our, so we can have personal convenience and pleasure. Although there are, God is a very gracious God. He does give many good things to us in this life. The ultimate overriding goal that he's after is that we grow in godliness, in holiness, in a manner that gives him glory. So what, it is, it, what is it to be a partaker of the divine nature? For starters, it's important for us to keep in mind that's the starting point, not just the end goal. And Paul writes how Jesus became sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. This isn't a matter of works, how I work hard enough and do things just right enough, then I become a partaker of the divine nature, or as the way Peter puts it, or I, I become righteous. I become righteous at the outset as a sinful man, turning to the Lord Jesus Christ, confessing my sin, acknowledging I'm a sinner, I need his forgiveness, I need his salvation, and asking him to be my Lord and Savior. That's the starting point. So that, when he, what Peter's talking about here in the divine nature is the starting point, not the end point. So, at the same time, you're changed. We have a new nature within us. That divine nature enables us to escape the corruption that's in the world. Now, on the one hand, it's helps us to it, 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 well, it doesn't help us. It, it enables us to escape the eternal consequences of sin when we turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. But we're also challenged in this life to put off our sinful ways of thinking and talking and our attitudes. And as I say, that's a process. John wrote in, in his first letter, "Don't love the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes." and the pride of life. He goes on to say, those are the things that are going to pass away. Whether we need to love the Lord, hold fast to him. The Greek in that part of 1 John, there, there's, I'll just point out when he's saying, don't love the, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the, of the boastful pride of life and so on. But a couple of ways of giving a, a direction or a command. Say if you got a child, you say, now I don't want you to be noisy when we are at church today or when we're at this meeting or when we're getting together with relatives. It's not that the child necessarily is being noisy now, just kind of a general directive. Don't do that. Then there's the directive of, child, you're being noisy, stop it. The tense that's used in the Greek in this part of John is actually the latter. 
You love the desires of the flesh. Stop it. You love the boastful pride of life. Stop it. it it's more that sense, all of us. I think every person in this room, I, I'm no exception, we all love those areas where the desires of this world can draw. Can, can, and the, the specifics may vary with each person depending on your personality and different issues, but we all have those areas where there's that struggle, that lure, and the challenge is to grow, to press on. So uh, we're not called to live self-indulgent, sinful lives. The liberty that we have in Jesus Christ is a liberty that isn't to give us, more, it, it, it's not just to free us from the eternal consequences of sin, but to free us from the dominion of sin in our lives. We should not use God's grace as a cloak for license or the knowledge of God as a substitute for obedience. And again, this isn't how we get saved. This is rather the response to salvation. If we've been saved, if we've humbled ourselves and bent our knee to the Lord Jesus Christ. As we read on here in 2 Peter now, he says, For this reason make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. So, genuine faith should be reflected by godly character. I don't have time to go through all of the, the specific things that Peter lays out in that list, but suffice it to say one of the things that he makes a point here is we need to learn to control our passions rather than let them control us. And there's that old man who's always battling. You know, Paul writes about how the old man was buried in baptism. So I heard one Bible teacher say once, maybe he was buried in baptism, but he sure did a good job of holding his breath. And, uh, <laughs> you know, because he's still got to do battle with that, that nature that keeps wanting to rear, rear his head along the way. So godly character also corresponds to godly love for one another. Peter points out he, he, that godliness should result in brotherly affection, and, and that brotherly affection in godly love, which is the word agape, which many of you I'm sure are familiar, is often referred to as the ultimate of God's love. That love isn't a love that I'm going to love you because you love me. God loved you and me when we hated him, when we despised him, when we were in the filth and corruption of our lives. He sent his love upon us. That's the love of God that he challenges you and me to as we live in a world that is increasingly hostile to biblical faith, as we live in a world that wants to lure us down the path of deception and immorality. What's the challenge? to grow in a godly way that we can actually reflect God's perspective of love, not to a world that deserves it, not to people who deserve it, but to people who need the redemption of God, who need his forgiveness. So uh, godly character responds with godly love for others. And we live in a culture, of course, that talks a lot about love, uh, songs, how many hundreds or thousands of songs are there out there about love? And I'm not saying they're all bad. That, that, that's fine. But what's the reality in our culture? The reality is when we live in a culture that abandons moral standards, the result is not really in love but the exact opposite. What we have is increased selfishness, self-indulgence, hatred, strife. What's going on in our, on our culture today with the abandonment of biblical morals, what's happening in so much of the world, in, in, in the places where we go to market, and where we work, and so on. Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, because lawlessness is increased, the love of many would grow cold. Lawlessness breeds lovelessness. And throwing off biblical morality does not result in greater love and compassion that actually results in exactly the opposite 
Those who reject biblical morals may talk about love for one another, but actually what they'll demonstrate is the precise opposite. They'll grow great, uh, greater hatred and intolerance for those who hold fast to biblical truth and who do not embrace their values. They will accuse the godly of hatred and abominable deeds. Just as 2,000 years ago, as Tacitus recorded, you know, the abominations of the early Christians who wouldn't participate in their pagan rituals and their hatred of mankind. They didn't really hate hatred of mankind, but they may have hated the sin of mankind. So also that's what we face today. So uh, we're challenged to press on. Peter says, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. There is a challenge that Peter puts down to us. And in a lot of ways, I don't like it. If we don't go forward, we risk going backwards. Uh, one analogy somebody used, if you're on an escalator or something like that, or one of those things at the airport where you can walk along, if you're not going forward, you wind up going backwards. Um, the, the challenge for us is that we're not here to coast. Failing to press on, to grow in godly character, risk the, the specter that we could lose our way. We forget. We forget the price that Jesus paid for. We forget the squalor of our sins. By analogy, at that first generation of the Israelites in the wilderness. Oh yeah, Lord, deliver us, deliver us. Okay, they got delivered, but then when things got hard in the wilderness, what did that generation say? You know, it was better back in Egypt. You know, we had better food back in Egypt. They would grumble and complain. There's a warning there for all of us that we don't, we don't forget, you know, the, the depth of our sin and the price that Jesus Christ paid for us. We're always going to face a constant temptation to give in to the pleasures of this world and instead to desire the voice, and, and instead of desiring to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. And there's that lure, as I said, that, that's out there and it's barraging us on the internet, on TV, on the billboards, on just about everywhere you turn, in the, in the, at work, wherever we go, there's that lure trying to pull us away. And so part of Peter's challenge here is maturity is not an accident. In verse five, we read it a little bit ago. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith. Okay? Make every effort to supplement your faith. And then in verse 10, he says, Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fail. And as I was reviewing that part of his letter, I noticed the words effort diligence, and practice. That involves conscious choice, doesn't it? Now, so that, that tells me that growing in the Lord isn't an accidental process either. Now again, we grow by God's grace. Coming back to where he said it's the divine power, his power, his strength is what enables us to grow, even to respond in obedient faith. It's his divine grace and his power that enables us to grow. So it's more than just me trying to drum up the right effort and the right attitude and the right atti and positive mental attitude or whatever. But having said that, it comes from that personal walk with the living God. How do we get, how do we flow in his grace? How do we hear his voice? It's one thing for me to know a person, know of a person, it's another thing for me to sit down and talk to that person and have a dynamic relationship with that person. Peter's challenging us. We need to have that personal walk with the Lord. We don't have the prerogative to coast in our walk with the Lord. Uh, when we're facing the tests of life, we've got choices to make. When facing that persecution, that hostility, the rejection, 
the price that may come with standing for the faith of Jesus Christ. Or alternatively, when facing the lure and the temptations that this world is throwing at us to pull us back into a lifestyle of sin, we still have those choices to make. And so we're called to cooperate. One way that viewing biblical truth is many of the principles of scripture involve a certain tension. Um, one analogy that I, uh, a former pastor had was, truth is like a bird, it takes two wings to fly. For every principle of God's truth over here, there's another principle that stands in tension with it over here. And uh, if you've ever seen a bird with a, a wounded wing or something like that, you know, what can get us in trouble sometimes is we latch onto one piece of scripture and boy, this isn't working very well. And we, we lose some perspective. My point on this, we grow by the grace of God, but he also gives us choices to make. Are we gonna to respond to his grace? Are we, going to, are we going to respond to that grace? Are we gonna to listen to the voice of his Holy Spirit? Are we gonna to listen to our selfish, sinful nature? There's a tension there, and it's not a, a, a simple thing. We don't get to coast along. We have a dynamic where we have to make some choices along the way, but if we do press on, there's a glorious future that lays ahead. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As we persevere, as we seek to follow God, to give him glory, and we're all gonna stumble, we're gonna struggle, we're gonna fail, we're gonna miss the mark, but as we do, there's a glorious destiny that lies ahead in Christ Jesus. There, we don't earn salvation, but as we press on to know him, I think every one of us in this room would want to say uh, when we step into eternity to hope to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant, to be faithful in, in the thing that God has for us. So just summarizing a few things, looking to the goal to endure in a race, a runner needs to focus on the finish line. When, when Peter was talking about his last will and testament here, when he's passing on some of his thoughts, knowing he's going to be martyred soon, what's, what's, what's the point of all this? Well, throwing an analogy to running a race, say particularly a marathon. You don't run a marathon like it's a, a sprint. To endure, the runner's got to focus on the finish line. Because if he just focuses on the pain, oh man, my feet are so sore, oh man, my legs are burning, my lungs are burning, yeah, I'm, this hill is so long, he's probably not going to last, right? You don't have to necessarily have to run a marathon to see that. The capacity to press on, to endure through the pain and discouragement requires the runner to look beyond the immediate sacrifice. He's got to see beyond that. There's a finish line. Not everybody can run 26 miles. I want to finish, I want to finish this race. I, 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 that's, my, that's what I want. So what's the end goal of the Christian life? I think that's part of what Peter's talking about here. In the face of the persecution, in the face of the temptations. First of all, who are you in Christ? And second, what are you called to in Christ? What has he called us to? What's, what's the end goal that he wants us to keep our focus on along the way? A few applications. We're not alone. Others have faced worse. I outlined some of the tortures and sufferings that early Christians faced a couple thousand years ago. And frankly, some of our brothers and sisters are facing some horrible persecutions in other countries. So in that regard, we need to keep a, a perspective as to how tough we have it. But to endure, to finish the race, we need to focus on the goal. And that means we need to remember what we are in Christ and what he's called us to. We lose sight of that. It's going to be hard to handle the other things that are thrown at us in the coming storm.
we, talk, we are partakers in the divine nature, or alternatively stated, we become righteous in Christ by His grace. It's by His power, His grace, that we can grow through, our, through the promises of Scripture. It, the ultimate goal being for us to grow and mature to reflect godly character. The true knowledge of God is based on a relationship of love with Him that includes godly attitudes of character and moral standards. And in the coming storm, we aren't permitted to coast. Um, we'll have choices to make. And that's the, the thing is, what do we do? As Peter, facing death, was saying, keep perspective who you are, what you are in Christ, keep perspective of where he wants you to go. Focus in on the goal that lies beyond the immediate pressures and tests and temptation. Keep your eyes on a glory that lies beyond what this world has to offer. Because there's a glory that lies beyond this present life. Whatever suffering, whatever sacrifice, whatever ostracism, whatever pain we may have in this life, there's a glorious destiny that's far greater, far more powerful, far more profound than anything a sinful world can offer. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, I know I've but poorly conveyed the thoughts you have here, but I pray that your word will grow in the heart of each person in each of us here that we'll keep a perspective on, um, keep a perspective of who we are, where we are, what you've called us to. If there is any here who has not uh, turned to you, who has not repented, who has not sought you, I pray that that young man, that young woman, that older man, older woman, whoever it is, will turn to you in repentance and faith and receive the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Help us to press on, help us to grow, to look beyond this life, to look to a destiny that lies ahead. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.